time with Stephanie Story. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm Stephanie Story. For those of you who know my novels, you know I primarily write about art history, uh, usually, you know, the Italian Renaissance. But for those of you who know me personally, you will know that I produced current affairs for PBS for about a decade, honing my very own personal lifelong obsession with American uh, history and politics. So I am very excited to have this conversation today. My guest is a White House historian and the author of the new book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. She's her BA from George Washington University and her PhD in early American history from University of California in Davis. I have read her work in the Washington Post and Time Magazine. Welcome to the show, Lindsay Travinsky. Thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. Uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm happy to be able to have a, a good long conversation about this stuff to help me wrap my brain around uh, what is going on in our world. So I will certainly get to how all of this history plays out for all of us and helps us understand our current moment. But before we do that, I want to make sure that our listening audience has the right context. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people at home just assume that uh, the president's cabinet came up with the Constitution and it was just immediate and it was just part of part of the executive branch. Can you tell us how it really started, where, when, why George Washington made the decision to create the first cabinet? Absolutely. Well, your viewers would not be alone in thinking that it was sort of there from day one or in the Constitution. Um, in fact, the word cabinet does not exist in the Constitution and it did not the delegates to the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected a proposal for the cabinet because they did not want it in the government. So when Washington entered office the first day that he took his oath of office, he was not anticipating having a cabinet. And in fact, he did not convene a meeting until two and a half years into his administration. So it was very much an organic development that occurred in response to the pressures that he was facing, both diplomatic and domestic. Um, so it was very much an evolution that happened as the government was, um, you know, growing and people were trying to figure out what it actually meant to be doing day-to-day -day governing and not just have it written down on paper. So, so what were the immediate implications of that decision? Like back when he brings Jefferson, he brings Hamilton, he brings Knox on board. What are the immediate implications of, of, of that decision for, for the government at the time? So, I mean, so from a constitutional perspective, the delegates had set out a couple of options for the president to consult with people and to get advice because everyone understood that you can't have someone who's governing completely alone. And they had set up the Senate to be a council on foreign affairs, which is quite different than we think of the Senate today. Um, but at the time, it was relatively small. There were only 24 senators because Rhode Island hadn't yet ratified the Constitution. So it was very small. And 24 is not an impossible number. Um, but Washington went to meet with the Senate and quickly discovered that they were going to act like a legislative body and refer things to committee and debate and discuss and be very slow. And he wanted immediate advice. So when he rejected that option, right away you have this um, role that the Senate was supposed to play in the Constitution that he has rejected. And so that's pretty enormous because it still says that in, in the Constitution that hasn't changed at all. But it shows just how much, you know, when you write something down with the government, then when it actually when it actually hits the pavement and when you're actually doing the work, things tend to change because there are unforeseen circumstances. So once Washington actually convenes the cabinet and he brings together the four men that you mentioned, he sets a precedent that the president can consult with the people he wants to consult with when there are moments of crisis or he has questions about the Constitution and really establishes a legacy that has shaped the presidency and the executive branch since that point. Um, and of course, it had huge implications for his presidency as well because he was surrounded by these advisors. But it actually set a pattern that has you know, lasted hundreds of years because every president since Washington has had a cabinet. 
Now, has every president since, since Washington, I always think of, of, of Washington, and you talk about this, that Washington's cabinet was a team of rivals. It was, mm-hmm. you know, Jefferson versus Hamilton is sort of the famous one now because of the musical Hamilton. Like everybody get that they were on the opposite sides. Yeah. And that that's in a way where our first parties came from as mm-hmm. the divisions over government started. Yeah. H- has every president had this like team of rivals or have they sometimes not done that so much? Yeah. Well, at least up through Lincoln, it was pretty common because you were generally pulling from people, from the leaders within your own political party. And the people who were leaders in your own political party tended to be rivals to be your successor. So Monroe is a great example. All of Monroe's cabinet secretaries were dying to kind of come after him and were constantly squabbling over who was going to be sort of the heir apparent. But so, so that up to Lincoln was pretty common. Um, most presidents today end up having some conflict within their cabinet And I would actually argue that that's a good thing because you want to have, you want a president to be surrounded by a lot of different perspectives. That was something that Washington did really well. He knew what his limitations were and he knew what knowledge he didn't have. And he pulled people into the cabinet that would be able to offer expertise on things that he didn't know about. And he sought out that advice and listened to it and then made a decision once he had all of these different perspectives. And so for him, it was really helpful to have these cabinet meetings where Jefferson and Hamilton were bickering and squabbling because he was able to hear the different perspectives and their debates were almost like a stress test for the different perspectives and the different um, policies that they were advocating. And it was a way for him to sort of sit back, hear everything, and then make a decision in his own time. And so today, I would argue that really successful presidents, and this holds true for the 21st century as well as the 18th, surround themselves with advisors who don't necessarily agree with each other. And so then it's up to the president to manage those personalities. And that is, of course, sometimes an easier <laughs> easier said than done task. <laughs> who, have you thought about who's been the most successful <clears throat> modern day president at running that kind of cabinet? Sure. Were they conflicting well, ideas? yeah. I mean, with, with the really current presidents, it's hard because we don't have a lot of the um, archival evidence hasn't yet been unclassified. So we don't actually know who is saying what and who's advocating what and exactly the behind the scenes workings. Um, so some, some 20th century examples that tended to go very well. So FDR was really excellent at managing his cabinet because he was a master of sort of playing people off of each other and really was able to allow his secretaries to pursue different goals and pursue different policies, but then he retained the final decision. Another president who had a really effective cabinet was Eisenhower, and he had great relationships with his secretaries. They tended to be a little bit less um, diverse in their perspective. So FDR actually had Republicans and Democrats in his cabinet, especially during the war. He wanted that bipartisan support, whereas Eisenhower's secretaries tended to be a little bit more uniform. But he was really, really good about managing all of the details that were going on in the executive branch, which is something we actually didn't know about until the evidence started to become declassified because most people thought that he was old and kind of doddering and not really paying attention. And in reality, he was super on top of everything. And so um, that's one of the great things about history is as you discover more information, sometimes your ideas continue to change. Okay, you mentioned presidents overseeing wars and we are in the middle of an enormous crisis right now. Mm -hmm. I have a a few questions about this as this moment relates to history, but Mm -hmm. But one is Washington certainly over oversaw his his share of crises. We were coming mm-hmm. out of the revolution. I think of like the Whiskey Rebellion, which was like mm-hmm. a fascination as a kid. How how did he manage crises from an executive branch standpoint? Sure. What was his process like? And then what's that like compared to today? Yeah, well, so I mean, the government itself in the 1790s was obviously a lot smaller, but um, Washington and the cabinet were very focused on trying to make sure that the executive had a lot of oversight over these crises. And they really carved out spheres of influence over domestic policy and diplomatic policy, and even sort of as a constitutional arbiter 
which is really fascinating. And most people don't necessarily think of Washington in that role. But so if something came up and Washington felt like immediate action was necessary and um, there needed to be sort of a policy that was crafted and put into place and implemented very quickly and with sort of firmness, he usually felt that he needed to do that because Congress was sort of out of session half of the year, basically. And the states tended to disagree with each other or had weak, more weak governments. Um, and keep in mind, he had gone through the revolution, seeing sort of how inefficient Congress could be. And then the Confederation period, when the states were threatening to, you know, break into factions and Congress was completely useless. And so he really felt that executive power was the answer to a lot of these problems. Um, and the Whiskey Rebellion is a great, a great example of that, which I talk about in chapter seven in my book. When the Whiskey Rebellion broke out in Western Pennsylvania, Washington had four options, basically. He could leave it to the states. He could wait until Congress came back into session. He could convene an emergency session of Congress and ask them to deal with it. Or he could basically set policy himself. And he and the cabinet decide to set policy and then they essentially like browbeat the state officials into complying with their policy, which is the letters are just hilarious because they're so, they're just, they're bullies. And it's, it's, it's good reading. It's good historical reading. Um, but so they took like an active, a very active approach to trying to expand executive authority because he felt that he was really the only person that could do that based on how the other branches of government functioned. It's so funny because I feel like we're in the same exact debate now. <laughs> With President Trump saying, oh, well, the, I have total power. The states can't do well, it. Well, you know, it's really interesting. I, I have to sort of not comment too much on the current administration because of my nonpartisan job. But I will say there are a lot of historians have been noting that there is a strong vibe of the Articles of Confederation going on right now. And it is unusual in the 19th, 20th, 21st century for the states to be leading the effort. It is, um, it hasn't happened in a very long time. Um, and I would argue, and I did argue actually in an op-ed for time that the founders didn't really, they would never have seen coronavirus coming, of course, but um, they understood that there were national crises and there needed to be a national response to some of these things because you can't have you know, 50 different states negotiating diplomacy or 50 different states negotiating economic policy. Like it just doesn't work. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people feel that way now that there needs to be a national response because it is a national crisis. Yeah. It's just interesting to me that, that George Washington was a proponent of executive power, which sometimes, which mm -hmm. we all debate back and forth all the time. Sure. Right now. Yeah. It doesn't he matter. definitely he definitely didn't think he had unlimited authority. I should be very clear to say that he he and so one of my favorite moments that I really like to to throw in about Washington was he first exerted executive privilege in 1796, and um, the House of Representatives was asking for some papers relating to the Jay Treaty, and um, I talk about this in in Chapter Eight, and he they asked for papers that related to these negotiations. And he said, um, he basically said, no, he said, I have complied with these requests in the past and I will continue to do so. But I think that diplomacy really requires secrecy and you need to be able to have trust. And so with diplomacy, I'm going to you know, turn this down. However, if it were an issue pertaining to impeachment, I would gladly comply. And he actually uses the word impeachment. So he recognizes congressional authority to have oversight of the executive branch. He also recognizes that there are a couple of exceptions, but that they are not um, unlimited exceptions. It's, it's just so funny to me that 200, 200 plus years later, so much has changed in our government. I mean, it's gone from this tiny thing to this giant yep. Yep. organization, basically, that controls so much of our lives. And it's just changed so much. And yet we're having the same conversations as we did right after the yeah. revolution when we were debating the constitution and our founding fathers were writing the Federalist Papers. Like, yes, yes. How it's, is that still happening? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, in, in some ways it's kind of what makes the United States unique because we do put our founding documents up on a pedestal in a way that most other countries do not. And so 
people writing documents in the 1780s could not really have foreseen 21st century, at least some 21st century problems. So that leads to a very unique and interesting conversation about how do we apply 18th century language, 18th century limitations, 18th century ideas about government or gender or race or voting rights to the 21st century. And it, it brings up a lot of challenges. Um, but I would say it's also what makes history great is that it does tend to inform where we currently are. And you can't understand where you currently are unless you know what has come before. No, you cannot. Um, okay, so you said we obviously, it's very difficult 200 years ago for, for any founding father to imagine where we are today. But have you mm -hmm. thought about what Washington or Jefferson or Hamilton or Knox or, or any of these early founding fathers, any of these guys in the cabinet, any early president, what they would like about where we currently are in our politics and what they would be trepidatious about, what they wouldn't sure. necessarily like. Have you ever given that any thought? Yeah, I mean, so like one of the questions that, you know, we grapple with is that Jefferson and Hamilton had very different visions of what the country would be. And um, for those of you guys who don't know, Jefferson really thought that it should be a country of human farmers, which meant that basically each man could have a farm that was big enough to sustain himself and his family so he could be independent and he wouldn't be reliant on anyone to govern his vote or his voice. Whereas Hamilton really favored industry and merchants and trade and sort of thought that cities were the natural progression for the country. And Jefferson thought that cities were prone to sin and corruption and they were gross and dirty and disease and so he didn't want anything to do with them. So obviously, to some extent, like Hamilton's vision about industry and trade and industrialization in cities has sort of won out. But there is this, um, there is a sense in American identity and American culture that is very Jeffersonian, that people still think sort of the, the farmer or like the, even I would argue the, you know, white picket fence in, the, in suburbia is sort of a, an evolution of the Jeffersonian ideal. Um, so I think in some ways they would, they would, recognize some of those issues obviously if they saw a plane they would say you know I mean, like why is there a metal tube in the sky um so you know there's things like that that i think they'd be very confused about um for all of their support for executive power and executive authority and um the expansion of government i think that they would be a little horrified today at where we are and i'm not saying that that we should agree with that because you know, there are, there are aspects about having a really big government that I think that they would approve of, like education um, and healthcare, if that was available, um, roads and infrastructure. Washington advocated for a, a national university. So, I mean, they were in favor of these things and some of their ideas were very much ahead of their time. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, some things they would just be like, what is going on? But some they would be thrilled that had become part of, you know, common parlance. Okay, now I have to go to a geeky writer question because I'm sitting here part of, I'm loving hearing the history because I'm such a big history buff. But I'm also loving hearing a fellow writer talk about something that she's clearly very obsessed and passionate about. Yeah. Clearly care about this stuff. Yeah. Where did your personal obsession with American history come from? You know, I've been, uh, you sent me that question and I've been thinking, I've been, I always try and like think of what is my origin story. And I wish that I had like a great aha moment, but in reality, I was such a dork as a kid and um, I was a voracious reader, just like constantly reading, um, you know, and couldn't get enough, was always looking for new things, loved historical fiction. And I think that I really liked trying to imagine what life was like in a different place in time and what, um, what maybe felt the same in terms of, you know, like I would read Laura Ingalls Wilder, and I would, you know, um, identify with some of the same frustrations, but then obviously it's a, it's a wildly different experience. I'm not living in the forest. So I think that I, I really enjoyed that process. Um, and, you know, we did, when I was in fifth grade, we did this project where you would uh, dress up like you know, in the colonial period and you'd go and you learn how to make candles and you would like sew a little quilts and you would do all of these activities, which I mean, I look back on very fondly. And after that, I think I spent like a week, um, like trying to read and write by candlelight, <laughs> not using electricity, which my sister still makes fun of me 
to this day. Um, and so I think I just was so fascinated with trying to figure out what people's lives were like and um, what that experience felt like and how foreign it felt, but also how similar. And then as I started to get more serious in my studies and my education, I was, I've always been really fascinated by how individuals can influence events and power and government and, and um, I don't know, maybe, a, maybe an interest in like, how does, how does one person become like this great historical figure? And it's usually having something to do with influence. And I would argue that at no other time in American history, at least, have four or five guys had more influence on the development of history and events than in the 1790s because the government was new and growing and evolving and it was still so small, but um, had such global reach really in terms of its decisions and, and ramifications. And so that's kind of where I zeroed in on and uh, just never left. And um, as you said, I mean, it takes a lot of passion. This can't really tell, but it is a chunky book. Um, and I had, I had a lot to say. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I love it. And I don't, I can't imagine really doing anything else. Okay, but you said something now I have to ask about it because you're talking about you really care about people who had a big impact in history, which is the same way I feel. I want to write about people who have big impact in history. Yeah. Most of the time in history, that was men, right? Yeah. So we're yeah. both, right? I mean, I'm writing about Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael. Yeah. They're dudes, you know? Yeah. yeah, they're dudes. Your guys are all men. Yeah. You wrote an interesting piece about that. My question is, do you find that as more and more women get to mm -hmm. come to history and write about these big male figures who tended to always be written about by men, by male historians, mm -hmm. do you find that women write about these men differently or have a different view or different perspective or? Yeah. Um, well, I can, I, I mean, I can kind of speculate. I, I speculated about this in that piece that I wrote that you mentioned. Um, and I, I do think I don't know if it's intentional, like I don't, maybe it is for some people, but they sit down and they say like, I'm going to approach this from a different perspective and a different way. But I think it also, it's actually very deeply ingrained in that women approach the world differently than men because they're women. And um, for better or for worse, there are certain limitations. And, um, you know, obviously there's a diversity of female experiences and white women tend to have it a little bit easier than women of color. I mean, you could, you know, could go on and on and on and on, but, um, you know, women received suffrage much later and, uh, you know, all, and there were, there were states that you couldn't get a credit card without your husband's signature until 1970s. So like the female experience is a different one. And so I think that for better, or for worse, that perspective as a citizen and perhaps as a historian, because as you mentioned, um, these histories tended to be dominated by men for the vast majority of scholarship, the history of scholarship. Um, that different perspective does maybe give you um, sort of the foundation to look at things a little bit differently. Um, I know I personally, I didn't go at it thinking like, here are five guys and I'm gonna write about the five guys. So I'm gonna write about the five guys as a woman. But I did kind of think as I was like looking through the story, what part hasn't been told? What can I bring to the table? Um, and in some ways, what I bring to the table is that I'm telling the story and I am a woman. And most of these people that write about these things tend to be men and that in and of itself is interesting. So, or some, at least people seem to think it's interesting. Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't really have like a great like aha answer about why that's happening. I think it's great. I would love to get to a moment where it wasn't shocking that a female historian wanted to write about men because men were writing about women and women are writing about men and it would just be standard and accepted. But um, in the in the meantime, I'm happy to sort of be the, the sort of like odd person doing it because it's certainly, um, it's brought me opportunities because people are curious about it. Uh, one last question. Uh, is the pandemic, this thing we're going through, is it changing your perspective on history in any way, or is it changing the way you're thinking about writing about history? Yes. So, I mean, like, obviously this is a historic moment and um, I have lived through several historic moments, maybe too many, um, you know, 9-11 and the 2008 economic crash, but this is, 
unprecedented. And one way to look at how unprecedented it is, is that Queen Elizabeth II has given, I think, four addresses in her entire um, tenure as queen, maybe. Um, and she was, you know, around during the Blitz and she gave an address for this. So um, this is like, you know, a once every 25 years historic speech moment. Um, and so I don't yet know what like the ramifications of that will be for history. I suspect that there will be completely groundbreaking and, and ways that we can't even begin to comprehend yet about how it will shift our day-to-day -day life and our world. And I, I can't say that I like look forward to that, but it will be interesting to see how it evolves. Um, in terms of the practice of history and writing, unfortunately the phrase, you know, necessity is the mother of invention is so true. Um, I think that history will be forced, people who, who share history and tell history will be forced to be um, more creative about their venues of sharing this information, will be more creative about technology, will be more creative about how to reach audiences, um, about how to reach sources and archives. I was trying to find a document the other day and it's at the National Archives and there's just nothing I can do right now. <laughs> so it's like, all right, well, I guess I'll wait. Um, and so that's going to be really interesting, but I also think that can be a gift. I think that a lot of historians have sort of for a long time stuck to the tried and true methods. And what I've sort of learned with technology and online events and all these things is that there is an enormous audience who is so passionate about this subject and they really want to learn about these things. And if we have the opportunity to reach them, then that is a gift and that is exciting and an opportunity we should pursue and so while historians aren't necessarily the most technologically savvy bunch, because they tend to, you know, be fat backwards facing instead of forward thinking, um, I think that it's a, it's a challenge worth trying to overcome and um, there could be great opportunities on the other side of it. Well, from one history nerd to another, <laughs> I love the conversation. I have loved hearing your insights about George Washington, the cabinet and early American history and, and all this stuff and about writing and, all of this. This is just right up my little alley. I can't help myself. Yes, no, absolutely. I'm not sure I've actually confessed the uh, candlelight thing publicly before, so that's a, I'm glad that that's out there now. <laughs> I totally would have done that if I had thought to. We've got times <laughs> end of stories, talking stories in a novel way. Story time with Stephanie's story.